Hey everyone. This is another long one for you, but it's an oldie. In fact, I don't have the same hair. Well, I mean, I barely have hair at all, but that's not the point of this. This is back after I was just getting home from, I don't know, a job some damn place in a hot part of the world and I shaved everything off. But it is with a person who has much better hair and much better questions, much better things to say. So an interesting cat uh, I've met through a number of interesting ways. His name is George Oakes. George has a podcast called the Rights and Wrongs Podcast. And it talks about human rights, freedoms, uh, things that we can do with our freedoms that are helpful to others, some things that people try to do with our freedoms that are not so helpful to us. We explore a whole bunch of fun topics, and I've had this sort of sitting in the can for a while. He had released it to his viewers and subscribers, and... He said, hey, if you ever want to release it to your people, I'm, I'm happy to share. You know, here's all the content from it. So here's all the content for you. I honestly don't remember every little bit of this conversation, and I might not play through all of it right now while editing this. So who knows what's in there? All right. I hope you have a good time. I hope you enjoy it. Maybe you tune into George later. He's a nice cat. Hope to see him around as the world keeps opening back up. All right. Enjoy. Stay safe out there. Welcome to the Rights and Wrongs podcast, the podcast where we talk about rights, privilege, and misconceptions. Today, we're going to be talking about human rights in terms of security. I am joined by Deviant Olaf, which I just learned to pronounce. Um, if you recognize him, you might be knowing it from his channel of Deviant uh, Olaf on YouTube. He's also very commonly seen on InRange, where people might know you a little bit more with playing around with guns and teaching us safety on that stuff. But I'll let you uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is really cool. Uh, I am Deviant Olaf. I show up in a lot of funny places on the internet. It's actually amusing to me when I'll comment on something or, you know, I'll, I'll just kind of drop in a message somewhere and it, the conversation will be mostly, oh, that's an interesting point or, oh, I bought one of those. But what, there's always this trickle of like, hey, you're that guy. What are you doing here on Alex Technology Connections channel? Uh, it's like, well, I'm on the internet. I'm, I like a lot of things on the internet. I show up a lot of places. Uh, much, much more than I show up on my own channel, which is nothing more than just a creative expression for me. Uh, Twitter is a place for me to say swearing on the internet, and YouTube is really just a place for me to talk about fun stuff that's not my job. Although my job is what a lot of people do like. Uh, for those who have followed me in some of my professional speaking, I run and help to, uh, to oversee a covert entry team. So physical security is my company's main focus. Uh, we both educate and do consultation, but also the adversarial emulation side of things, the, the old uh, movie sneakers, if you're not too old for that reference, right? The, we break into your place to see how secure your place is. It's a fun job. I, I get a lot of people asking, how do you get that job? How do you, you know, the, the flippant answer is we'll have some of the right friends, some of the wrong friends, which is true. I mean, that's been part of the process, but it's been a long journey. It's, it's a very niche industry. Not a lot of people do what we do. And I'm proud to be just one little part in uh, the security landscape. And it's amazing because as many people might know, I used to work for a contractor that used to work defense security. So I remember walking around like, oh, I'd be looking at all this like tie-in devices and these scanners. I'm like, what the hell do they need me here for? They got these cameras, they've got these badge readers. We've got a control center. Like I'm irrelevant. And then I just watched like a 45 minute video of you. And it's just like, all this technology is a lie or if... <laughs> It all has it all has its uh, vulnerabilities, right? Yeah, and like that was the whole entire thing. I always find crazy. I know it's a little standard when you talked about a few of your videos about like dealing with security guards and like and you show mm -hmm. up to pretending to be the elevator repairman or something. It's a little bit different on our side of security for like defense work because if we don't know who you are, like we're gonna throw you out. Like you have to have every we have to know your birth date and your dog's name before you're allowed into our building. Yeah, but most security's not like that. Mm -hmm. And most security guards yeah. don't care. Like they just want, like you said, they want their elevator fixed or like they just want the alarm on the computer to stop going off, even though you're probably the one that made it do that and depending on what's going on. Yeah, there's, you know, there's gaps in the armor. Yeah, that's why we speak, of, most people speak about security in layers. The layers are there uh, to cover those little overlapping areas that aren't necessarily overlapping. I, I can, like the most boring analogy in all of this, because a lot of the work we do is boring, right? Uh, you're talking about like foot candles of illumination in a parking lot and you have two light fixtures and they're both going to cast light down. 
but you might say, okay, well, dead under the fixture is this many lumens, and okay, we're in compliant with you know the the specs. But as you get into one and into the other, well, like, well, aren't they going to wash each other together? Well, if you know, we talk about automated lighting controls, and you could say, computer, turn the lights down by fifty percent. A human being, that's actually really dark, really dark. If you drop the lights by only about seventy-five, like to seventy-five percent, your brain will think it's gone more than halfway down because the way light works. And you might tell someone, yeah, well, you had this light fixture here and this light fixture here, and you did the math and you're like, well, isn't the middle, isn't it fine? Well, no, it turns out you go out there and you do the field test and you're like, no, it's, it's not overlapping the way you think it is. By the way, anyone curious, the official standard is that you should be able to read a driver's license or newsprint unassisted, even in the dark, uh, if you're in an illuminated area by like spotlights. Uh, that, is the, that is the official documentation standard. And a lot of lights don't have enough coverage and a lot of security systems don't have enough coverage and overlapping to make sure if one is, you know, an edge case is another system going to pick up on what the slack is. No, and it's crazy too. Cause like, I know I'm coming in dark on my screen, but like, I, I broke my ring light that I was like, I finally ordered one. And of course it came broken, but like my apartment is like, right Same here. <laughs> yeah. It's like blindingly bright, but it's interesting you talk about light because every time that you're working as a security guard, you look at the camera, it's like, why is the camera already dark? And then you walk past that area and because you don't even think about how, because when the people set the lights up for the hallway, they're thinking, oh, so people don't trip, but they're not really paying attention to make sure the camera is getting the light. And yeah, being a podcaster, I never paid attention to like how much light bouncing around plays. Mm -hmm. um, but before we get into that, I did want to hit the main thing that we like to do on Rights Wrongs podcast, which is the wrongs part. Which yeah. is, do you feel, are there any buzzwords that you feel that the, I mean, when it comes to security or your field of work that is overused, misused, or just a buzz phrase that media likes to throw out and just like, they have no idea what they're saying? Oh, a few, absolutely. Um, so my favorite one of all, the kind of the best story, all the other examples I can give will be you know, bad compared to this one, but the best one of all, which all credit has to go to a friend of mine named Bruce. Uh, so Bruce Schneier has talked about the idea of the word, even the word secure and security, but like to be secure. It is a weird quirk of at least the English speaking world are the way our language, like if I'd say, oh, I want to be secure. That can mean a couple of very distinct things. It could be the practice, the reality, the actual objective standard of I am in a uh, structure that is well built with small apertures and any portholes like doors and windows are robust and reinforced and have locking devices. By many uh, like objective standards, that is to be secure. But that's not the only way in the English speaking world we use that term. I can say, I want to be secure. Well, that's very, that's, that's emotional. That's feeling. I want to feel safe and sound. And this is, I mean, it's such a wonderful story example of how it, it trips up a lot of what we all try to do. Chasing the feeling of security, often in pursuits that don't provide meaningful security. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, all the wrong implementations of nonsense after 9-11 that we still have with us when we try to travel and so forth. You could say, oh, that doesn't make us secure. That's it's all theater. Well, to a lot of people who aren't security practitioners, it makes them secure. They are they're like, oh, check that. I feel secure. I am. I've I had made me secure. Well, we don't we don't thin slice a lot in our discussions, what we are actually meaning in terms of our objectives. And the the quirk of language in terms of oh, I'm I work in security. I want to make people secure. What do you mean by that? Where are you putting your values and your resources? Uh, it's, it's a fabulous, fabulous analogy. And it's a real difficult challenge. It's a challenge of language and of communication. It really is. And it's also like something to add on to that is living here in the UK coming in from America and especially coming from like a military background and stuff like that. I remember I went down to London and I remember I was just walking past the stables and the stables like when it's like you have the royal stables the guys sitting on the horse mm -hmm. and it's kind of cool and i'm paying attention to the cop and the person i was with was paying attention to the cop because i've noticed the gun but the reason i noticed the gun that was weird is because they were holding like this weird i didn't recognize it it wasn't an uzi it wasn't a mac 10 it was just some strange smg where me thinking like in a large area like that has no accuracy and brains like like why do you yeah. have like i'm thinking as an american that's a useless firearm 
but she was like they have a gun and like that's all it's secure like there and i noticed like everyone that was the uk people noticed the cop with the gun and i'm like everyone's paying attention to the cop with the gun but they're not paying attention to their surroundings around there so this idea of security is almost making everyone less secure like i just thought it was a weird sight because oh yeah yeah it is um <laughs> it, it is just it's, it's, i remember when uk police weren't armed at all and then after a few incidents, uh, this is, gosh, this is going back quite a ways. They started arming their officers, which that resulted in way more use of force, obviously, including some lethal force. Uh, but yeah, it was this weird sea change for the, this whole country where people weren't used to seeing the firearms. And then again, like the blessing of, oh, magic dust, firearms are out there. Some people would say, oh, I, we are more secure. I feel secure. And a lot of people are like, no, this is this is not the way I'd go about this, Chief. No, and it, it's funny because I've talked about this before on the podcast. It's I am more scared of a Scottish cop with a shield and a baton than I am an American cop with a shotgun. Just because mm-hmm. like it's not for show for them. Like by the time the shields and the batons come out for them, like they're going to use it. Like you're going yeah. to be in pain. Like there's they have NHS for a reason. Like they have socialized healthcare. Like we'll break your leg and then we'll fix you. <laughs> but yeah. It is an interesting idea of security because you talk about the police side, but we're also talking about the physical side or the idea of security because that's like one of the buzzwords I was going to look at is what, like as you said, to feel secure, but also what is security? Because security is Article 5, you have light, you have the right to liberty and security under the ECHR, which is the European Commission for Human Rights, which is enforceable. I think it's around 32 in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Mm-hmm. It's sprinkled across the U.S. Constitution. They have rights to secure, like you have security, but it's always just kind of thrown as security as this word that you're supposed to know what it means. Mm-hmm. But to be secure in one's papers, person, and effects. And then when you deal with that, you have always those like constitutional lawyers, like, oh, I'm secure for myself. But then you have like Article Four, an Article Four, well, I'm mixing myself, uh, Amendment Four, which is mm-hmm. uh, right uh, to no Ill- unwarranted search and seizure. Mm-hmm. But then you determine like, well, what is unwarranted? What determines as a search or seizure? So that's like always the thing I find confusing when it comes to security, especially in the realm of rights, because you have the right to secure yourself and keep yourself mm-hmm. secure. But the government is also supposed to keep you secure. Mm-hmm. And there's this strange balance because you have to have liberty and security. But it's also at the same point where it's like, yeah, we, everyone pays for the cops. Like that comes out of your tax dollars. But then if that was the case, you have that strange thing where companies then why do companies have private security or why do they hire you to make sure that their private security is doing the job that they're paying them hundreds of thousands of dollars to do and that's like one thing i was going to get you i was going to ask your question about is like what do you think when it comes to security does that actually mean yeah there's a tremendous amount of push pull and as you even point out we have we have various forces that are paid for by our taxes to keep us secure ostensibly. Uh, so there's a there's an interest in the government keeping an individual secure, but there's also, as evinced by many of the parts of the Constitution, the language used, there's an interest in the individual being secure from the government. And the even as we were both quoting the Fourth Amendment, by the way, any listeners out there who love getting like deep to untangle a lot of those questions, what is a stop? What is a search? What is a so-and-so? Um, if you want to look up uh, Joshua Dressler, I believe, uh, Professor Dressler's criminal procedures class. Uh, he is a professor who's done wonderful, uh, I think audio courses are as well there. I remember back when Dressler criminal procedure was available on tape. Uh, I'm, I'm old, but it is out there. Uh, there are, there are uh, recordings of it. It's probably on some streaming service that you pay or stream illegally or who knows what. But yeah, fascinating how the courts over the years have decided what level of interruption in a citizen's day constitutes a search, constitutes being seized by the, by the authority, by the state. And even, even that one line that I quoted, the citizen's right to be secure in their persons and papers and effects, I'm not even sure what a reading of the Constitution means in terms of, is it, does, do you have the right to feel secure? or to actually be free of intrusion. I like to think, well, frankly, both. Life is healthiest and our society is healthiest when not only can the authorities not just rummage through my stuff, but I go through my life day to day believing that to be true. You know, there are plenty of instances where a search wouldn't wouldn't cut the mustard constitutionally, but it's going to happen anyway because you're there on the roadside and there's 
you know, you don't have a phalanx of lawyers backing you up in that instance. So there are plenty of us who constitutionally, we recognize that a search might not be permitted, but we're like, well, this is probably going to, I'm going to be screwed here. They're going to go through my stuff and I have to pay for a lawyer later, which is incredibly oppressive financially. Or is it really just meant that, well, society's interest is that as long as people feel secure, they will write great writings and do great business, even if the government can come trudging through at any point. Uh, you really do need both sides of the coin. And we are we are not good at supporting both sides of that to be secure because we're not good at uh, giving voice to both sides when crafting legislation and when enacting public policy. No, and it's a good point when you put it because my favorite thing when he talks about this and defining, because that's the main reason I like to do this podcast is I want to make sure, and I'd like to make sure people understand this. I'm not really trying to make sure people are politically correct because politically correct ensures emotion. I like to make sure people are academically correct because mm -hmm. we can't fix the problem if we're because every industry has industry speak like mm -hmm. i was in the military we had military jargon i worked as electrical engineer worked as security now i work in human rights we all have shorthand we all yeah. have our jargon and i'm sure i have acronyms that mean something specific to me that you have the same exact acronym that means something totally different mm -hmm. or in the english language is very limiting compared to other languages so we can say the same sentence and it could mean a thousand different things, but I think it is important to make sure we're academically correct when we talk all about a lot of these issues. And like one of my favorite things is people are trying to figure out what you're talking about is like, what does arrest mean? Or like the best thing is, well, they didn't handcuff me. It's like, well, that doesn't really mean anything. Like the second they stopped you, you're at rest. So you're technically yeah. arrested because you were stopped. Like people don't understand arrested means stopped. So the second you got pulled over, like technically you're arrested. So if you pull away after you got stopped, like you're resisting to be at rest by the authority. And it's when you try to break that down, I think people understand it more because when you say arrest, people instantly think handcuffs, Miranda rights written or whatever your nation's rights, if you have that. And I think there's an important point that you talked about, about how we have to know what these actually terms are. But one thing I did want to ask you is a lot of my peers um, or in Southeast Asia or in the, in the Middle East, like in their home nation or certain European nations that are now dictatorships just because mm -hmm. COVID opened up some interesting political moves for it. Yeah. So a lot of ambition, let's just put it that way. Uh, so we're talking about these things in a nation, for the most part, we're pretty secure. Like there are places where the government can abuse power and it does happen on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, there's a good argument. It happens less to you or I just because we have less melatonin in our skin than other people. Yeah, we have a, have a lot of inherent privilege. We both are college educated. We, we both have some economic independence. Yeah. And so, and it is like a very funny thing when you think about when a cop pulls you over and you're like, you're, you're most likely going to let the cop check your vehicle just because if you don't, then it's like you're somehow guilty for not letting an officer, like you practicing your rights makes you guilty, which is a strange thing, but you don't, you're not gonna tell that to the cop because now they're gonna, just any, like, this is the best, this isn't legal advice. This is just kind of good advice when dealing with law enforcement. Don't quote the constitution to a cop. Like that's the fastest way for them to call back up. And <laughs> they just consider you mm -hmm. an annoyance. Uh, but I was gonna ask, do you have any advice for people that are actually in nations that being in the field of human rights or just like be speaking up for their protection of security? Do you have any like little because you love talking about with your handcuff of keys or right. like, so like what locks not to buy or what to be aware of when you get a hotel or just yeah. safety or anything. Do you have any advice on that? Um, a lot of it comes down to where people, like how upstream in the decision matrix people focus. Uh, what I mean by that is a lot of people who like to speak of covert handcuff key. And I'm not pulling your example, but this is a great example. People love to talk about restraints escape stuff with me because I've given talks about this. And there are so many things that have already gone really wrong. If like, you're like, well, I got my covert handcuff key on me right here. I'd be like, I really hope that's not what you're going out into the world thinking that's your main problem solver. There's, there's all like, it's the same. It's no different than if someone has a concealed carry firearm, in my opinion, someone who goes out into the world and is like, well, you know, I've got my uh, I've got my little Glock 43 right carried appendix right here. I'm good. There, there's a lot of, I would call it friction reduction, that is way more important. Those are those are everything has gone wrong, and I need to introduce some extreme adversarial behavior, 
to like solve a problem. If you are literally taking off restraints that a, that a cop has put on you, or if you are producing a firearm, potentially willing to shoot it. Uh, there's, there are so many friction reducers that I really believe strongly that everyone should be practicing. And those are the best mitigations for a lot of violence and a lot of uh, bad results in someone's life. So for the person who's carrying their, you know, their pistol, knowing how to de-escalate an argument to get out of a bad situation before it becomes a bar fight. For the person who is in a, like, let's say in Burma or Myanmar right now, they might well have, you know, some covert instruments on them that they are potentially using to extricate themselves from an extrajudicial arrest, right? But being able to travel in as, I don't like to use the term gray man, it sounds very tactical, right? But being able to move through space in a way that doesn't draw great attention and being able to move through direct person-to-person -person encounters in a way that doesn't raise the hackles of the person to whom you are addressing. Um, those things, they might sound a lot to a lot of people like capitulation, like, oh, you, you just telling people to be weaklings just to like look down and the cops won't hurt you. I mean, it depends what your environment is. If you're not walking around with a ton of privilege and power, if you don't have a U.S. black passport and the State Department calling up the, you know, the station if you get arrested, the, I, the consequences of getting arrested might be way worse than the consequences of some wounded pride if you look down and kind of defer to authority from some joker on the street. Uh, we don't teach a lot of people, including, frankly, many authority figures. We don't teach a lot of de-escalation and uh, friction reduction skills. That's, that's my main thing. Because most of the time, like, okay, let's say literally you were illegally arrested. They're trying to get you in the back of a squad car in Burma. And you happen to be able to slip out of those handcuffs. Now you got what? You've got two officers ostensibly who've like seen you. And I assume you're about to start taking swing and swinging on them, uh, potentially with the cuff still in your hand. This is the best weapon you got. You can, I can teach people how to use that, you know, iron claw. Just go ahead and, you know, just really draw off after with that thing. But now what? What are you going to get back to your hotel? And these two guys are just going to sit and talk about how their day sucked. No, like now you have a city dragnet potentially going after you who has been identified as fighting the cops what are you doing? No, I love that you talked about this because the last published episode I had was a two-parter with a gun podcaster. And we talked about this because he was from a state that is open carry. I'm from Massachusetts. So mm -hmm. I do have my concealed carry license and I'm a strong, I strongly believe in concealed carry because I don't, I think open carry one makes you a target two yeah. just takes away your choices because you have the choice Absolutely. to the second you have the gun that's that you've already like shown this is your first choice. But mm -hmm. we were talking about this where we don't teach communication skills. We don't teach um, hand to hand. And I don't mean like you have to get out there and come on black belt or stuff like that. It's just learn how to fight the way you are. Cause like the military, there was a train as you're going to fight. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to probably get into a fight wearing jeans and a jacket, cause I'm from a cold neighborhood, I probably should learn how to fight in jeans. Cause that's a different than when you're fighting in things. Like, so you have to learn that they can grab these things. Or if you have a yeah. bag on you, you have to be aware of this but you don't want to get into the fight. The best thing is to escalate. And like, sometimes like you might get like, oh, this person might be wrong, but as long as they're not harming anyone else and they're not harming you at that moment, walk away. Like that's mm -hmm. like, I, and I don't, you see that on the streets so many times, like with bar fights and stuff, it's just this pride gets in the way, but you're talking about something yeah. I think is really important where it's guns and the thing. It's funny you talk about the handcuff because I literally have my handcuff key right here. My friends always ask me what it is. Like I've had it there for yeah, yeah. years, but it's, it is true because it's one thing I'm trying to like, because I think it's great that you're saying is like, we're not saying don't have the handcuff key in case we get put in that once in a million life situation, like do the Boy Scout thing and always be prepared. But if, if you're already in that situation, you made so many bad choices before mm -hmm. it got to, or those bad choices were made on you. Were made but, for you. Yeah. Yeah. But when you're looking at like the decision forks in the road for you to be forced into that situation, I guarantee you made a bad choice somewhere in there. Like, yeah, we're human. We're going to make a bad choice. But that's, it, it is a little different though for us talking about in like the US. Like, yeah, you do have oppressed people in the Middle East, in Asia, in South America. Uh, they, it happens. Even parts of the United States, like human trafficking is still a thing in the US. We don't like to talk about it, but it is. But you do well, There's a whole lot I could get into with that, but yeah. You had to talk about buzzwords. Oh man, go on. Sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's, 
Uh, but no, that is a whole, I'm actually gonna have a guest on there that was um, sat, like, she's really open to speaking about, she was a victim of human trafficking. So that would be an exciting episode to have. Uh, but no, it is really crazy when you think about this, when it comes to security, because we're talking about to be secure in our own self, but you also have to be aware of security. And it's just so many different worlds of it. Like, I find it crazy for when you people walk into their apartment and they have all those buzz doors, like with you and your, what is it, a paperclip and like six keys that you know get into anything, you can get in there. Like you're not kicking yeah. down doors. You're not scaling the wall and doing parkour and not wearing a ski mask. Like you're just walking into something. So there, you do have to make sure there's a level of trust because no one's broken into my apartment before. So I have the trust that even though it's probably really easy to break into my apartment, you know, it has to. So when you walk into a potentially dangerous situation, I think we should also keep, be aware people can be bad, but also give them the benefit of the doubt and use communication to like, maybe this is a misunderstanding or sometimes that I like to do in Europe is play the dumb American. Works nine mm -hmm. times out of 10. Like, um, yeah. but so I'm just trying to like go over the questions you had that. Uh, I was going to ask, do you have any advice for people that are currently working at home now to like be better at security? Cause I know you probably have a million different things for like cyber side. Yeah, on the physical side, a lot of it comes, like my first thought always goes to threat modeling and, and risk assessment, right? Is someone's risk, the fact that they're working from home, is, is their risk that their work is so sensitive that now someone will ostensibly break into their house because of their work product? Or is their risk just that, you know, burglaries, most burglaries happen during the day, not at night. In many jurisdictions, it's less of a charge, in fact. Uh, so like now that you're home during the day, are you more likely to be, you know, in your home when like a potential, you know, illegal entry is attempted? Like, is that someone's risk? Is someone's risk the fact that uh, just during the pandemic and during a lot of times of stress, people act out and lash out? Are you at more at risk that a person who really doesn't like you could potentially come find you at your house more easily than they could get into your building? Are you at risk because you know, intimate partner violence is a big thing, especially during times of stress when everyone's home all the time. So those, all those different cases uh, are very different types of solutions in terms of what is the best plan of action. What is someone trying to guard against? For broad strokes, for just broad things in general, assuming that your home, your, assuming your threat matrix isn't primarily focused inside of your home. So taking for a moment, the domestic angle, the domestic threat angle out of the discussion, uh, which we need to address far differently as a society, with very different ways. That's which all totally gets different. Back to human trafficking. No, um, it does in a lot yeah. of ways. Uh, yeah, and literally like give people, pla give people places that they can go when they are in danger without like fear. Like that's, that solves a lot of different problems, even gun violent problems with, you know, domestic, but we're not talking about that. So the main thing I tell people is have decent locks on your house locks that are good enough that someone can't use what I will almost, I used to call it kind of low hanging fruit attacks, but I really now just call them YouTube attacks. You know, uh, someone who is, we won't even say a junkie criminal, which I don't like maligning drug users. Most are not criminals. I will call it the nefarious teenager in the neighborhood because it puts it, it's a very, uh, it's a very otherworldly thing. Like all my friends in Canada, they're like, yeah, I mean, sometimes teens try to break into the garage. They're usually trying to steal beer. I like, I like how almost leave it to beaverish that kind of crime is. <laughs> so we'll say the, the neighborhood ruffian who has gone to YouTube university, if your locks can resist the things they might learn there, meaning really low stakes manipulation and raking, bumping, low, low caliber forced entry things, uh, you know, like jimmying, prying, like little, little ticky tack stuff. If your locks can resist that latch slipping on your door, like, God, how many times do I talk about this? Right. Then, okay, go. You are now light years ahead of most structures, most occupied, occupied structures, residential or commercial. If you are just not susceptible to what I will call YouTube level attacks, that's on the, you know, physical, mechanical, structural side of security. On the electronic side, um, we can talk all day about privacy implications. There's a lot of ways to do this, but can't like cameras and monitoring. 
all, all security devices from a mechanical standpoint, from a structural and mechanical standpoint, even safes. I'm a safe technician. We've got all this safe technician crap on the walls here. Um, even a safe is not designed to completely deny an attacker access. It's designed to delay an attacker. Uh, in your house, your any structure that you're occupying should be thought of as as will deter or de, or delay an attacker, but you need to be able to then detect and respond. The idea of a monitoring system of any kind, you write all like the off the shelf alarm, you know your your Honeywell, a Demco, which we tromp all over them in our alarms class. In the corporate world, that's not sufficient, but thing honestly, things like IP cameras have gotten massively cheap. There are ones that I don't like as much for various reasons. Uh, the Nest family of products, uh, besides being tied to Google and Google getting all of your information and forcing you to have a Google account now, they've changed that. Um, Nest, oh, so I honestly- they took the Apple approach? Yeah, they did. The, not too long ago, they forced people to have a Google account if you want to use their products uh, to a Google Home. Um, the main thing, I honestly just don't like Nest as a product line because they are wireless only with no local storage. So like if you jam 2.4 gigahertz, you can knock out an entire array of Nest products with no reconstruction possible. Like they're just offline. Uh, compare that to a product, uh, most really like the firms I know who do executive protection, they really like products by, I believe it's pronounced Wise, W-Y-Z-E. Hard to get now, they're like always out of stock because uh, their supply channels were impacted by COVID. But all the Wise products, they have little SD card capability. So they're, they're IP cameras, right? They're on networks, but if they're ever knocked offline, they're still locally recording as long as they have any power. And then when they come back online, they will then push that cached footage to the central server, which is what does all the logic of, is there motion? Should I trigger an alert? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, so it's really neat that, you know, then you get into like Ubiquity, who is not as good as people think. They spammed a lot of influencers with free product and marketing dollars. But the idea of having any kind of footage, even just your rinky dink, I bought it from overseas shady supplier kind of hidden camera products. I'm a big fan of that. We could talk about traveling on the road and hotels and people overseas. Um, a lot of times sort of spy cam products, not the greatest optical sensors. They're not what I would hope to use in like court for submitting evidence, but blanketing your room with three or four really cheap, easily hidden products. Maybe somebody who breaks into that room, if they are truly a bad threat actor, is going to spot one. And now perhaps you've, you know, now you've raised their, their awareness and what do they think of you? But they might not catch them all. And if you can at least alert yourself to the fact that someone tried to get in or someone was here, yeah, I think that's way more valuable because a lock might, like the lock and the door defeats one attempt that one time, maybe. But it doesn't necessarily inform you. It doesn't help you change your posture or upgrade your behavior. Uh, giving you information, giving you the ability to detect a possible threat, that has ripple effects that, that cascade forward if you're then afforded a chance to change what you're doing. No, I love that you talk about that because it's funny that I've told people when they travel is I have the camera I'm using right now for like high definition is a little Aitman. It's like a, I think it's like a Japanese knockoff of a GoPro. Mm-hmm. But like it was 60 quid. So I think it was like 70 or 80 US dollars, but it's much cheaper than a GoPro. But it has yeah. like Wi Fi technology where I can hook it up to my phone and I can put it in the window or I can even put it in the little spy thing that you have on the, uh, like when you're in hotels and stuff like up there. Cause people don't realize, oh, that's nice that you can walk up and send, like you can look through there. But that person, when you walk up there, like I guarantee you that person on the other side of the door knows you're staring at them. Like yeah. they heard you, they can see the shadow. Like it's, and now like, God forbid that that person has a gun, they clear have a clear line of sight to your face. I know that's an extreme scenario, but like having the camera on, like, oh, click on, like you can literally see there. You don't even have to let them know that you're there. Mm -hmm. It's also this big, so you can put it in the window. So like, if you think someone's following you, like, like if you want to go back to domestic, uh, domestic violence or like stalker situations, which happen more than people want to admit, um, mm -hmm. have that in the window like because now you don't have to go to the window so they don't know that you're no there but like if they're there like now you can like oh okay they're there and you have them on camera and you can press record and I love the fact that you talked about wi-fi because I'm sure you noticed like I have you on a projector right now because my second monitor broke but like yeah. I have a projector back here which I use for my television I have all my stuff here the only thing that's connected through 
wireless is literally my Wi-Fi. All my devices are wired. And mm -hmm. it's because I'm always nervous about something. Cause if like I can connect to it easy, it's like when I find things that are like user friendly, it's also hacker friendly. It's like a term one of my friends. Many told times, me. Yeah. Cause she's like, I can just walk outside your house. It's like, Oh, that's great. You have a Wi-Fi signal. that like, can meet every angle of your house. I can be across the street and probably break into your system and know everything. Yeah. Oh, your Alexa's hooked up to your Wi-Fi. Now I know everything that you've ordered through Alexa. And I'm like, that is terrifying. Cause technology is there to help us, but it is very much user friendly. Cause like, I'm sure like Amazon has the best corporate security that money can buy, but they're spending it on protecting the data that they took from you. Mm -hmm. They're not spending that money to protect them from stealing your information. It's from you finding right. out that you, they took your information, which is kind of scary when you think about it. Now, that was like one thing I did kind of want to get your fee uh, feel back on. Like I spoken on with a few other podcasts, but and I know like I did watch the episode with Carl where he went deep into this, but the whole entire issue of Parler, which I found mm -hmm. very interesting when it talks about security, because you do have security against like people doing, this goes into the whole freedom of speech issue, but freedom of people creating a mob or violence not talking mm -hmm. about the specific one you probably think I'm talking about, like that even that being a situation where that can happen is a security issue, but it's also very strange that you can have server companies or someone just be like, we don't like your system anymore. And then that's a whole nother security because that's security of business because people, their job was parlor mm -hmm. and now another business wanted to get rid of it. It's like, cause that's the whole other thing about security is this security is this really big area. It's like, yeah, security can be the locks on your door but you also need the security of income to afford the house that that door is being locked. And again, like it's, it's interesting you bring that up. Uh, I love that it's one of the top talking points that we have for ourselves today because this com to me comes all back to friction, to introducing or smoothing out friction. Um, Parler got targeted and taken down, rightly in my opinion, because they were a dumpster. Uh, because if they wanted to stand on ceremony and say, we are a place where anything goes, the most vile crap you can imagine, it's fine here. And that's not what they said publicly, right? Their public statement was, we have rules, we have policies, we don't allow hate speech. Like, well, okay, but sorry, if it walks and quacks like a duck, it's it a duck. probably is that. <laughs> um, but yeah, the idea of like, if they are going to be making themselves the biggest target imaginable, that is introducing a form of friction. That is introducing the likelihood that they will be targeted, that they will be experiencing business pressure, that they will experience all kinds of pressure. Um, and I, I, this is the same kind of argument that I have with the, with the gun community. Uh, frankly, people in the firearms world, I say if we don't, it's, it's, a lot of it comes down to self-policing. If we don't police our own, we will, can, we will see our community further targeted and further dwindle. Uh, the, the next generation gets to decide the world they wish to inherit. And people look at, you know, sort of the Parkland youth activists and a lot of, a lot of the new generation that are very vocal, very fired up. That makes perfect sense to me. They are, all they see is hopelessness and, and violence, even though violent crime has been on the decline for a very long time. Um, but that gets into but, that conversation about... yeah. Well, no, it's just because when you talk about that, it's just, I mean, I like to talk about how it's interesting how the right side likes to talk about with uh, qualitative data, quantitative data, and the left side likes to talk with qualitative data, but neither one knows what it is, because it is true, like, a lot of these crimes are in the decline, but now you have national news, so it's like, no yeah. one in your neighborhood's been kidnapped in, let's say, 20 years, but you're getting the news of someone from five states over that, so, like, now you think it happens all the time, because you're getting all the news every single time it happens. Absolutely. So no, but I also, I, t I totally agree with it with the firearm community because like I would love to get into become a gun advocate, but I find it very strange because I've applied for both like multiple gun advocacy groups. Cause like I see myself as a moderate in that field, which is, mm -hmm. this is also in the realm of security because people buy guns to feel secure. And also like a lot of times people buy safes and locks to make sure their guns are secure because if you're mm -hmm. a responsible gun owner, that's what you do. I'm just going to put that out there. Like, <laughs> make sure yeah. they can't be stolen. Uh, but it is a very strange that that's a really good point when it comes to security a lot of times, because that's one of those weird communications with friction where I see myself as a moderate, where it's like, some things the left people say, like, I think it's a little insane, 
like I, like coming from like my state, like I understand we don't need AR-15s in mass because like, yeah, we have coyote and sometimes a wolf and sometimes a moose, but for the most part, we have police can be there in two minutes. Now, if you're in Alaska, you need an AR-15 because grizzly bear and growler bear are a thing. Like I'm not walking out without a shotgun if I go for a hike out there just because I don't want to be someone's lunch. But there is like this, it's strange how some of these communications, especially when we're talking about security, because we're grazing the line and talking about international and national, but a lot of this is also state level or local level laws that you need to understand. But it does get really confusing with the gun side because it's either some people want to get rid of 100% of them or they want to legalize everything. Like they want you and your grandma to have an Abrams tank. And it's just like, it's somewhere in the middle guys. Like, and yeah. I get frustrated with it. I think one great com comment that you made, which I think was very fascinating was, I can probably misquoted, but something along the lines where you kind of got a little frustrated with the gun community. Cause you're like, we should also be focusing on like helping out other marginalized, truly marginalized groups, such as like the LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. And the thing I always find fascinating from the gun community is a lot of like people that I know that are in the gun community would be the first one people to correct me if I said, oh, this AR is piston, great. And they'll correct me in a second and they know the exact flicker and bigger and mm -hmm. this marker versus this marker, what that little dash on there. But he, him, his scares right. them. Like pronoun scare them. Like, you know, the exact vernacular for every little piece of metal that has nothing to do with the remote, but another human being wants to be called something because that's the personal, like that's right. something that drives me insane. Wasn't sure if, if someone has a problem with me calling it a Picatinny rail and they say, no, it's a 1913 rail. But yeah, oh, using someone's literally saying, don't dead name that person is a bridge too far. Oh. Uh, yeah. No, and and that's, that's really, that's sitting around the campfires with kind of, some of the loudest gun voices in the community. Because again, I, I'm a very small voice. I'm not a real, I'm not, I'm not anybody, right? But I know everybody. Like I, I am, I can just pick up the phone and call a lot of people that you you would see as being very loud and angry about things. And I've had arguments and they're like, what's your big plan to reduce, you know, to protect our future, Dave? And I was like, I don't know, like universal healthcare. That's pretty much A on my list. Maybe, maybe you want to get nuts, universal basic income. We're not there yet, but at least maybe some more affordable housing, more available housing. And they're like, what? And I say, well, yeah, because I actually believe that most, as do you fellow gun, you know, nut person who is, you know, very off the conservative reactionary side, probably. I'm not talking to you, I'm saying the fictitious person, imagine your most angry gun YouTuber, I've probably sat with them. And I'm like, well, much in the same way that you like to say guns aren't the problem. Like I'm saying guns aren't the problem. I'm saying that societal pressures, deep systemic problems in society cause all forms of, of violence and interpersonal conflict. Uh, the, 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 the fact that people love to crow about, you know, oh, well, it's gangs, gang violence. We don't really mean that. What we mean is that many forms of gun violence are in urban environments with people who are on the fringes of productive society. And many of those people are deeply underserved by our institutions, our official institutions of the economy, of policing, and because they know that if they have that, that's where these a lot of a lot of the violence in our society is retributive in the sense that you can't call the police. I'm not going to call the police because they won't show up and they won't investigate what you did to my neighborhood here. So I'm going to take matters into my own hands. My family is half Italian. Like this is why the mafia existed for years. The mafia wasn't just about crime. It was a parallel structure because the actual institutions of society weren't serving the immigrant community. Uh, and we act, we like, we understand the Cosa Nostra really well, but we act shocked at the idea of like, oh, there's all this violence on that street corner. Well, yeah, because who else is going to deal with what just happened to that guy who beat up that guy's sister? No one's dealing with it. And society is has thrown no resources at it. It does not shock me that someone's going to start a fight, maybe even with a gun. Yeah, and no, it's it's really important that you talk about it because like when we talk about universal health care, like someone just probably was like, oh, I thought this was a security thing. Security of health is a security issue. Like if, because people, if you're considering your gun to be a part of your security thing, which I think you should also learn hand to hand because mm -hmm. you need to like, I'd rather do non-lethal. Lethal should always be the last step, but like I can't be the best fighter if I'm not doing, if I'm not going for my run and I'm not doing my pull-ups, and that means, oh, I have to eat right. I have to go to the doctor. So universal healthcare is a very interesting thing. And there's just so many misconceptions when you're talking about this, where people want to make a statement without understanding the true story. 
because the things that always drive me insane is when people talk about it's like oh well even in like socialized healthcare nations you can still pay for like you still like have to you can one you can still pay for private health care but your privatized health care is going to be cheaper like i had to go in for an emergency filling for one of my teeth because i cracked it cracked one of my fillings, I had to go to the mm-hmm. dentist and like, oh, we can't accept any NHS. It's going to be out of pocket. I'm like, okay, how much is this going to be? And I'm expecting 600 quid, like we're like $700 to US thing. Oh, it's going to be like 15 quid, which is $20. I'm like, $20 for a filling? I'm like, well, what about the thing? It's like, oh, that's, uh, and it's like, do you want to clean it? And I'm like, well, how much is it going to be? Like 20 quid. I'm like, so I'm getting a full clean in this. And I'm like, give me everything. Like I'll pay for this out of pocket. Like it's, it's because there's that healthcare system uh, because they're making sure that the prices are set by the government. So they're not gonna, they're gonna charge the private industries a little bit more, but not much more because then you'll never get a private customer. Uh, the other argument too, when you're talking about the policing thing, which I always find fascinating and people get mad at me when they talk about anything socialized because we have this red scare in America and sorry for this we little do. tangent, but I always find it funny. The people that I know that are the biggest people against socialists are cops, firefighters and military, which like people go like, yeah. And I'm like, the biggest hero is like, well, all three of your incomes come from taxes. Yeah. You can argue that the military has added stuff to our economy, but like, that's not a good thing. If you really want to say anything, mm-hmm. like, please add to our economy through tickets and stuff like that. But th- if they're doing their basic job, they're not adding to the economy. They're adding to societal value because you have the security, but also it's like, oh, your pay scale in the military, the take for things, healthcare is hundred percent covered. Your mm-hmm. barracks is hundred percent covered. Your food's hundred percent covered your housing is based off your needs for your family and your pay is based off the quality of that you are. I'm like, I'm sorry, but that's the book of Marx. Like that is literally the pay scale. And then people make the argument for healthcare. It's like, well, I don't feel like paying for someone else's healthcare because they didn't want to take care of their body, but it's like, you're already paying for firefighters and police. And if you're coming from a high end neighborhood, I guarantee you've never called the police. You've never called the fire department. And so you're already subsidizing the use for the lower income to use that. Sorry mm-hmm. for that tangent, but it's just like, I think that goes into the whole entire security. Oh, absolutely. It, it, uh, that's just something that drives me insane. Cause like, it's scary when I try, mm-hmm. I'm a, I'm a democratic socialist at heart, but like, yeah, I, I can't you. say that in the United States because you're like, Oh, it's like, you're a communist. Like I'm not like, I, I care about the same things you do. It's just, I oh, like my dad was social security for 46 years. The word social is in there. We all, we all believe in like certain socialized institutions in terms of money all going there and then people getting benefits pulled out. You know, you talk to people about trash collection, you know, something as, as innocuous as that. People kind of get it through their head. Like, well, it makes some things make sense to be a public concern, a public, you know, endeavor, a public organization, as opposed to a private. It doesn't, does it make sense to have 17 different pickup trucks all all driving around trying to haul trash for different customers like on the same block or just maybe one trash truck uh society has grappled with this in many ways but other other sectors are sort of just so sacrosanct just may not be questioned they're only privatized services no i would like to see very much uh, a lot of systemic problems a lot of stressors on the average citizen removed because the way we do things have, are rife with inefficiency and they result in less desirable outcomes. And with a lot of those structural problems addressed at, at a much further up the stream, uh, things like interpersonal violence, things like economic-based violence, a lot of the, the real egregious things that catch the nightly news headlines would be similarly trending downward for the same reason that violent crime has been trending downward. Because it, despite all of our problems, economically, we're still doing a lot better in this country and in the world. Uh, we just have had our share of really bad hiccups in the last decade or so. Yeah, it's, I have to be honest, like there's so many times where like my neighbors or my peers or friends here in Europe would be like, what the hell is wrong with your country? I'm like, I, I don't I don't know. Like we thought things were gonna go good. Like I remember graduating high school in 2010 and just like, okay, this is, things are going good. And I, I don't know what happened. <laughs> Well, it's ironic that we touch briefly on things like uh, the media, both social media and, and broadcast media. I do believe that there's a lot of people that like to say, this is an unprecedented problem. And, and you're like, well, actually, societies have been grappling with that problem for a very long time. Um, one thing I do believe is perhaps the most unprecedented problem of our day that is a big problem 
and it gets right to the heart of free speech and media. I don't believe we have ever throughout history in a non-dictatorship state, in a, in a free society, ever had a so entrenched and well-oiled and high-powered media machine whose whole mission is to subvert and lie about other political positions. Uh, I'm going to try not to both sides this too much um, because I think both sidesism is usually folly. Um, and people, oh, the liberal media. I mean, CNN is a little tongue and cheeky for me sometimes, but to me, nothing on the order, nothing on the, and we won't even talk about Fox. I'm talking about Newsmax, OANN. The, these are real institutions with funding, with, with huge profits and huge market share, whose entire mission is to do nothing but distort and misrepresent reality. Um, just to misrepresent, a politician can stand on a, on a stump speech and say, I represent X, Y, and Z. And for a new, a ostensibly news organizations to report the exact opposite, to misrepresent blatantly everything that person just said and ram it into the public sphere of discourse, that is, I think, something we've never faced before. And it is why you find things like when neutral opinion polls are put out, academically worded, that are designed to, to, to remove as much bias as you can from the way the question's being asked. Do you support X, Y, or Z policy? You'll get a ton of Americans saying, yes, so I believe that you know, homeless shelters should be made available and people shouldn't be during a pandemic in a snap polar vortex sleeping on the streets. You get a lot of Americans saying yes to that. But if you twist that around into how it is packaged for broadcast consumption, those same questions can be asked in the most manipulative way that sends people, you'll get 90%, 98% in favor of keep it, you know, pull those tax dollars, they don't need it. And it's, we've never, in my opinion, seen a misrepresentation of, tr of truth and facts the way we do now. That is why I think America is the way it is. That's what I try to tell my European friends. No, I completely agree. Um, I've talked about other podcasters and other researchers. One thing I learned from going to the U school in the UK compared to the US, I have some issues with the UK because they like overuse fancy words. So there's a level of gatekeeping for language barriers there. But the mm -hmm. other difference is like, they know the average person here knows what research is. They know it mm -hmm. isn't just Googling things. And they like, and the first thing is when you see a poll done by the BBC, there is some level of faith there. Because most of the time I find it very strange when the BBC doesn't have a methodology. But then when I have friends like share things on Facebook, and I'm looking up the polls, I'm like, I'm trying to get the information. Like, where is this methodology coming from? Where is this research? And I realize this doing my dissertation. How many times other college researchers in the United States will misrepresent the polls that they're pulling for their research? And I'm like, you're an mm -hmm. academic. Like, you're at my level. How are you? And, like, and the scary thing is, is, like, the news reporters, for the most part, are taking the information from the researchers at faith. So if the mm -hmm. research is doing it wrong and then the journalists aren't doing it properly, because no, I agree, like there is a level that you have it on both sides, but it's not the same level. And mostly when it's on the left, I think it's more of a marketing issue because mm -hmm. it's like, if you aren't the first person to report it, you're the last on an issue. So yeah. like, they'll miss, in, like they'll say something like, this is the news and they'll correct themselves later down the road. Um, but I will see other things like ONN and like other people. I followed other podcasters before, like I want to have on because like you could have like award-winning journalists. And I was listening to one of their podcasts and they were saying like, oh, we can't get the coronavirus vaccine right now, but they're getting it right now in the UK. And I'm standing in the UK. I'm like, we're still like six months off. Like this is yeah. a thing called Brexit. Like we might not be getting any vaccines because we don't have a trade deal with the rest of Europe. Like we're in a worse yeah. situation than the US is at that time. But they're spreading these lies, but I'm like most Americans would never even think to fact check this. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. to myself six years ago, like she's award winning, she knows what she's talking about. And I'm like, that's terrible. So I agree with what you're saying, because like even Fox, you're supposed to be going with that. But we are coming to an hour. I did want to give a chance for my guests if they wanted to ask you any questions. And I didn't want you to means. be able to, while they're writing, if they're going to write anything if you wanted to talk about any of your social media or your stuff or your projects that you're that you do yeah i don't have uh i mean projects my my projects are, are silly and show up on my youtube channel i guess half of my fun these days is this um 
taste test turntable project where I try different beverages with my wife or just myself and doing samples of whiskeys and wines and so forth. Uh, I am findable uh, out there on that internet with my name that's hard to spell if you can only hear it verbally, Devian Olaf. But Devian, you'll put it down in the notes or what's yeah, it? Yeah, try to hear it like. Yeah, O L L A M uh, is Olaf. Uh, so yeah, I'm I am that on on Twitter, on Instagram, which I don't use much except photos of cats. I I use Twitter for swearing. I use Instagram for photos of the cats, and I use YouTube for doing silly things that no one should care about. So apparently, I am. I am batting a thou on that internet. <laughs> yeah, I feel bad. I'm sorry Facebook, for the not sounds. On LinkedIn, not on any of those things. No, I said I feel uh, so, but, sorry about the sounds because, like, my cat came up and decided that he wanted to bump against the table because he's a he's a chunky dude. So. Oh yeah, Whisper jumped in my lap for a minute, and Frankie's asleep over there. So they're they are participatory. <laughs> There's a rule in a lot of uh, group conference calls that I'm part of. If we can hear the cat, we get to see the cat. So I would have had to pick them up if they didn't already present themselves. Well, no, and it's. I didn't get a question, but one thing it is very interesting though too, when we're talking about security, because you mentioned your wife and this is something like I try to be very good about because I know you as like, as a fan, because I followed like Carl and all this stuff. And like he had a tactical girlfriend on not too long mm -hmm. ago where she hides her identity. And when I had a person on for guns, which I thought was interesting, he hid his identity because it's a very sensitive subject. And like, I kind mm -hmm. of thought like, oh, wish I, I wish I knew to do that before. I did podcasting, but it's part of my persona. This is who I am. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was interesting. I try not to do that thing where I don't like, I really enjoy the content from a lot of people. And, and it's hard not to get into that celebrity. I want to know everything about you because you have that weird pseudo relationship where like I hear your voice in my house a lot. So that my brain thinks there's an actual friendship there that isn't, and you have to fight it. And a lot of people don't. And you see a lot of it like really nasty and weird comments in people's mm -hmm. YouTube. But I didn't realize this until I uh, added you to like that something on uh, Twitter and followed you. Your wife is really big in the international game when it comes to a lot of stuff, which I never knew. Yeah, which I found fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So she speaks at a lot of NGOs and IGOs. Uh, she works a lot with the OECD. Uh, she writes for Brookings and Foreign Policy. And um, yeah, so she's she's got way more game than me. Uh, she's actually she's in your neck of She's on State Department travel right now in the UK. So she's going to be there for about another month. Oh, that's um, yeah, yeah. She's she's exceptional. No, that was the thing. Is like I saw that because I'd love to talk to her as well too. But it's a, it is an interesting thing though because we were talking about security and once you become a a presence online, I should say, because mm -hmm. like you're more, you're definitely I consider what like celebrity level because like people are thinking like, oh, he's not Brad Pitt. I'm like, yeah, but more people know your face just walking down the street. Like no one recognizes me unless like I went to high school with them. Uh, right on. But, but you're that thing but there is a strange thing where you have to be aware of certain things like I don't talk much about my partner when it's on there and like one I like to normalize the term partner because even though like I'm in what you people would call like a heterosexual relationship I like mm -hmm. normalizing the word partner because it's like it means like hey love is love like it doesn't matter yeah what's going on there but it's the other part about it too is like I don't like giving a lot of information because like that's her she's not a part of this and I don't want to drag her into it because someone finds that I say something because I've said some things like on the gun podcast I kind of made a point if you buy a gun to do an armed protest that's kind of level of treasonous because you're kind of going to fight the government and like I realized after that I'm like oh like that someone's not going to like that but I'm like there's legal standing to what I'm saying like mm -hmm. be careful why you do something but people will get mad and it's it is fascinating about that and no, I wasn't sure if you had anything to say about that because like you and your wife are both known figures yeah. in your fields. Oh, there's a lot that goes through our minds about this. Um, we're, we're incredibly fortunate in a, in a few ways. It's very kind of you to, to speak of me as, as anything more than just a derpy guy on the internet, which is all I think of myself as. But I do, I do recognize there are times when I am, I am not just your average anonymous person. Uh, it's very, it's funny to me. It was actually the first time I really started to appreciate it was at, uh, there's a very large firearms expo in the United States for any viewers and listeners who don't know, it's called the SHOT Show. Um, just the annual 100,000 people, massive thing. And I go there, I go there with Carl and Ian, in fact, uh, just kind of as support for them at, and their channels. Uh, so Carl has in range TV, Ian has forgotten weapons, uh, both of whom have, you know, intimate partners 
they they have spouses or partners and you like they don't you never see Ian's wife right but like Tara and I just stay with them when we're in Arizona uh but like when they're on the floor of SHOT Show everyone knows Carl and Ian and they get stopped every seven feet and photos and selfies what was really funny is I'm just the guy like with the camera and the sound gear right I was starting to get noticed at booths people would cut not because like hey you're with I've seen you on his channel this is before I was ever on Carl's channel right like the people at Ghost Gunner, people at Defense Distributed be like, Deviant, hey, what's up, man? I like your hacking stuff. I'm like, oh shit, really? How the fuck do you know me? So yeah, being identified and a lot at SHOT, which is not my home crowd, right? It's not like I was at DEF CON. That's the first time I was like, man, people kind of know who I am. And the real, you pointed out just then, it was really interesting where people who hear a voice a lot in their home, even if it's broadcast, uh, people can form kind of parasocial relationships with this. It's a very one-way relationship. And the idea of, I mean, well, like you mentioned tactical girlfriend, right? Like amazing, brilliant mind. She's brilliant and has a ton of fans and gets a messages vaulted at her from every direction. But it's not like she's going to get to respond to every person. I have reached this weird place, mostly because I'm this guy. Hey, it's that guy. I'm like just barely recognizable that I can kind of reliably shoot a message out if I have a question and most people will ping me back. So like, I mean, she and I are in touch every now and then. Uh, I, my wife and I like, again, people who don't know me on Twitter don't really like, I have a ton of connection to like the whole world of sex work and the adult industry, uh, which is why my brain perked when you mentioned human trafficking, which is such a load of bad science and many, many bad faith arguments are made. But most like adult stars that I reach out to, they'll like, oh, hey, you did that work that one time with that guy and I saw you at this conference. So it's weird for me that I can kind of get a response. I'm not gonna get invited to tea and dinner, but I can kind of like have that brief moment of connection if I have a question for someone. And it's something that I really do seek to maintain. Uh, I, I really feel it's rough emotionally for people to feel very one-sided. Uh, if people reach, like my DMs are open. Like my Instagram messages are open. And people will sometimes express surprise if they shoot me a question, I'll get into like a half hour chat with somebody just back and forth, not every second, but I'm working on this and I picked a message him back. And at the end of like, dude, I had no idea you could just talk with, to you like this. I'm like, well, I mean, you called me on a good day. I was not super busy, but I want to try to do that as much as possible. I still answer every email I get because it's very hard to feel alone out there, to feel like you're I don't want anyone to be up on a pedestal. I certainly don't want me to be up on a pedestal or un unattainable or something different than just another guy in anyone's mind. No, I understand that because it's because I've contacted a lot of other podcasters. I even contacted Carl and Ian if they wanted to be on because I thought they might have interesting points when I was trying to like do stuff. But I do notice like some people would like you always hear the story of like if they don't get back to you like oh this person like I'm going to now stop supporting them on Patreon and all stuff. It's like no, it's like they're busy people. Like if, if they read my email, don't want to respond. It's like. Okay, like that's the reason I said thank you for reading because I know I sent you a really long one, but like that's kind of you have to do a little bit of legalese on a lot of, mm -hmm. and especially when I do politics, it's like I've dealt with a few people where I've had on and it's just like I didn't publish those episodes because they went in interesting directions in American politics or down the rabbit hole and it's like, yeah, yeah. But no, it, it is really, and I think it's a really important thing because you get caught up in this and just when you do have that strange connection, because like, I think people probably think they do know. And it's interesting you talk about that because like, I didn't know Carl had a significant other. I kind of knew Ian did, but that's just because like, he's mentioned her a few times, like from passing mm -hmm. on episodes. But at the same point, it, it doesn't matter. Like I find it strange how some people care, like, are they on the episode and like giving some information? Like if that sounds cool, but. But I, like, I was feeling weird if I should brought her up your wife, but I felt bad like, yeah, put you on thing. But I just like kind of thought like, oh, she's already up there. Like she's a really well-known person in international politics. And like, so I was like. Yeah. Oh yeah, I will be, I will forever be Mr. Tara Wheeler. And I'm okay with that. Oh, like if that ever happens, if, if I ever get married and like my wife becomes like thing, like I don't find that as her success. I don't ever want to say when people like, oh, her success is my success. Like no, her success is her success. I'm just happy they're willing to drag me along. Like they mm -hmm. didn't try and trade me in for like a better model or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I didn't get another question, but I was going to ask if there's anything that you wanted to cover that we didn't. Uh, we've hit just about everything. Let me scroll through. You know, we're not going to get too deep in the weeds of, you know, police reform, government reform. 
Um, we talked about various human rights things. We, you know, I'm, I gotta tell you, I'm super, I'm super interested. I've listened to some of your podcasts already. And you mentioned if there's going to be a human trafficking one, boy, howdy, will I listen to that? That's, that's one where I, I could turn into easily a podcast you couldn't publish because I believe it, it is so much uh, bad science and bad faith. Virtually every, here's my, you can even cut this out if you want from <laughs> to any listeners, any organization you've ever heard of, if you've ever heard of them doing quote human trafficking work, they are full of shit. They are, their numbers are all garbage and they are acting in bad faith. If you've ever heard of them, because none of the entities grow large enough in that field without doing bad science and getting tons of, of money. Um, yeah. Uh, no, like, just I think, I think that's, that's interesting too, because the woman that I'm working with that does it, because she, she worked in a thing, but I never heard of her company. So I wonder if it's one of the ones that, but Maybe. she, she like, but she knows what, it, it, but it's also a strange thing when it comes to human trafficking, because it, it's a lot like security on this, where there's a lot of, it's one of those fields that I feel like some people are very strong on one side or the other, but like, there's a lot of information. It's a very big umbrella. So there's a lot of like issues because you talked about like adult actresses and stuff like that. And like human trafficking, there's a huge horrible proportion in porn, um, but there's also a legal side to it, but then there's also consent. And then it's just, it's such a strange thing because if, if I say human trafficking, people are instantly locking their things. It's like, oh, like stolen people from like a third world nation. It's like, that's, that's a, that is human trafficking, but there's so many other different portions of it. But then also like, as you say, it's, we as a society, like this coffee cup that I'm drinking out of right now, mm -hmm. there's probably a component of human trafficking that was attached to this, this microphone that I'm using, this computer that I'm using. And it's something that like, I always try to tell like people when you work in human rights or you work in security or work in international politics, you kind of have to ignore these things because if you dive too much into it, like you're going to throw yourself into a world of depression. So- Well, I can, here's, here's a really fun, this, I could wrap it with this for my own, on this topic, right? that there is a fun parallel that you can make with guns and gun regulation and fighting the scourge of human trafficking, as it were. Um, first and foremost, as I'll keep hitting on, everyone's got to stay sharp to the bad faith, just bi billionaire bad faith, we'll call it. For every Michael Bloomberg of the world, who I believe passionately believes his own press, but I believe is a pinnacle of well-funded bad faith. For every Bloomberg on that side, on the human track, you have uh, Sonny Hunt. Uh, anyone wants to start pushing into Google. Again, billionaire heiress probably believes what she believes, hates sex work, hates adult liberation, hates women involved in it, hates them, and is a fountain of bad faith and bad funding, destroying people's lives in the process. Because they a, a well-funded person who thinks that they are sanctimonious, holier than thou is terrible. So that aside, even then, attacking these problems is best done through thin slicing. If you've got a gun guy on one side of the equation and you say, what do you think about gun violence? A really savvy, academic-minded one will say, well, what do you mean by that? Are you talking about suicide? Are you talking about intentional homicide? Are you talking about accidental death? Are you talking about intimate partner violence? Are you talking about crime-related violence? They will thin slice it because are you talking about mass and spree shootings, which get all the headlines, but really are not a big numbers. You know, they'll say each one of those is a very different facet. And if you just call it all gun violence, that doesn't really move the needle on solutions. So a friend of mine, uh, again, professional escort, well, super published author, friend of ours in, in Seattle here, Maggie, right? So Maggie McNeil, uh, Mags will talk a lot about, she's like, if you're talking about human trafficking, Break that down. Are you talking about forced labor? Are you talking about unfair or deceptive labor, labor practices? Are you talking about labor migration tied to someone who's a coyote or someone who's human smuggling? Like human smuggling is what a lot of people think of when they think of human trafficking. But human trafficking could be, I went there on false pretenses and was lied to. And then my boss started taking my paychecks and not giving me my money. That could literally be a story of a person doing agra, like picking fruit, or they could be a person having sex for money. 
but all of those, those are, there are very ways of thin slicing it. And you can break that up with different types of interventions. But if you, all you do is call it one big thing when it's not one big thing, and then throw a ton of bad faith arguments and bad numbers and a lot of money around, the problem never goes away. And a lot of innocent people get hurt in the process. No, and it, it's just really confusing because you're hitting on a lot of different things because me being my human rights academia and me is like, no exactly what you're saying because people always, I get asked on you know, other podcasts like, oh, we need an expert in human rights. Like, first off, I'm not an expert because I know enough to know I know nothing in this subject. But also it's, it gets really confusing because when you're talking about human trafficking, which is a huge thing, which we talked a lot about human rights, it's all these other things. It's this one word that people love to use on the media, which is a buzzword. Because like, I think I was sitting and I was, get, I was actually getting a dental appointment today and I was counted the times with the news on when they used the word human rights in just a mm -hmm. regular like news thing. I think they used it seven times with never defining it. And I think human trafficking is exactly as you say, like what are you talking about by human trafficking? In European mm -hmm. words, they prefer the term people smuggling. But yeah. for me, I feel like that's a very specific form of human trafficking where like because sex crimes and like people smuggling are kind of separated by a lot of european crimes mm -hmm. like because you do have it legalized i think they're pushing to legalize it in ireland it is legal in denmark and uh parts of germany and like holland and stuff like that but there's also other it's legal but not decriminalized which is a huge huge problem oh. de decrim decrim is the all my sex worker friends would never let me hear the end if, uh, if I didn't push for the fact that decrim is the solution that the WHO and that the UN and a lot of other human rights orgs want to see. Legalized is often just putting it into a legal framework, uh, which still leaves a lot of people exploitable because it creates a lot of othering and a lot of privilege and non-privileged situations. And yeah, the, the, the Nordic model and a lot of other, uh, such a mess. So this is the reason I say I'm not an expert in it because that wasn't, I studied mainly uh, police and military intervention issues in human rights yeah. or some yeah. of my peers, if they're listening to me, like, you know who you are, like they focus their entire dissertations on this subject. And so they, and that's the interesting thing about these fields. And it is interesting when you talk about gun violence because I always find it strange that when you find out like the most, for those people that are gun people listening, you'll be surprised that the most common bullet for killing a human in America is a 22. But then you also find out it's suicide and like, oh, that makes sense if you know how ballistics yeah. work. But that's a really great conversation and picture to show people. But it is all about the numbers. And like, that's something I've been talking to like other podcasters like um, Jay Kevin Powell for Global Windows Culture. We talked about this is learn how to read research. Like that's great mm -hmm. that you Googled and went to Google Scholarly and pulled up the research, but if you don't know how to read it or even test their methodology, like it always drives me insane. Like, you always see it now with like the people are talking about Black Lives Matter. Like, well, if Black Lives Matter actually cares about Black lives, why aren't they paying attention that most Black people die from uh, at the hands of Black people? Like, but most white people die from the hands of white people. Most people right. are actually assaulted by a familiar, someone in their atomic family, which is something like people don't mm -hmm. talk about. Like, not just a fa family member, like in your atomic family. So it's like, yes, you're right, but it's like you're missing whole sectors of information yeah. there did you know most traffic accidents occur with another driver from your own neighborhood <laughs> who yeah, would have thought <laughs> how could that happen yeah. no, it just because that's probably where 90 percent of the time you're driving yes. is in your own neighborhood exactly that's how this works it's no, why i love somebody once said it's amazing how many maps of like any given social problem are just population heat maps oh no like shit so goes down where people live yeah, like that's the thing is like, I'm pretty sure that like a moose is not doing uh, like hacking into a goose's account. Like that's just not happening. <laughs> yeah. Animals don't commit crimes. That's just called nature. Uh, mm -hmm. But no, and then for people right now, it's like, oh, these guys are totally off. No, all this stuff we're talking about is still security because we're talking about sex work and human trafficking. That's personal security. And that's the reason why when you look at this, I kind of put uh, talking about right to security in quotes in the title. Uh, just because of oh, quotations there, mm -hmm. because what is security? Like security was a word that was on my thing when I had a job, like that was job security for doing security. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, Fira, do you? Uh, need no, no, I was wondering which Norman Rockwell I had on the wall. It's actually the religious, uh, the freedom of speech one, uh, but there is there are the four freedoms, right? I, I have 
uh, Rockwell's Freedom from Fear somewhere around here. Uh, I, I move my paintings around sometimes, but. No, I also like have to say for anyone that's not like for audio listeners, his background is amazing because you have like a broken like padlock behind you and like all oh, your, is there a story behind that? You know, yeah asking. yeah so if anyone there's a, a youtuber another like again i'm just i'm friendly with a lot of people right so lock picking lawyer a uh, popular youtube channel and uh he's near us he's near our virginia office uh he comes by and hangs out and we we, we work together and occasionally on his channel he will use a semi-destructive we'll call it a pretty destructive attack where he's using a, a nail set gun called a ram set to crack locks right off their shackles and we were just with some students. It's always really fun when he stops by because we have students in our classrooms. We, we run training classes on a lot of electronic access control and lock manipulation. And I just ran a whole entry course for first responders. And when he's around, no one like, you know, no one's ever seen his face on YouTube, but he'll occasionally say something and you'll, you could tell people like, I know that voice. <laughs> and one person looked and went, I know those shoes. Holy shit. <laughs> Uh, so at the end of class, people who realize who the hell it is, they're blown away and they just kind of BS for a while. And someone's like, man, that Ram set, that's so funny. He's like, well, I have it in the car. Do you want to Ram set some locks? Because we just have locks all up and down our stairwells in this big open space. And people are flipping. They're like, oh, yeah, get the Ram set. So this was the last trip before the pandemic. This was March of 2020. Uh, early, early March, I was there. We were actually, the pandemic was becoming a thing. And Tara, she's like, switch your flight, get, get home, get home a day soon. I'm worried that flights are going to shut down. So I changed my flight to that evening. I was saying goodbye. I was like, hey, I'm going to hang, have a drink, and then I'm going to blast. So I'm going to watch this Ram set, though, because I want to see it. So, you know, he just points at a lock, and blam. And this, that exact padlock <laughs> bounced around off the stairwells, came flying right back at the assembled group of people. All of it, we're not like wearing eyes and ears. We're just kind of standing there doing this. And I just moved barely, got my head just out of the, you know, and it flew, it crashed right into my elbow, split my elbow open, but my face was okay. And he was like, holy shit. So from now on, whenever he does ram set stuff, you can't see it on camera, but he has a full face shield now uh, because we had never just had a lock react like a kind of a hard to predict football bounce. So yeah, I bandaged my arm up and got on a plane. Uh, but that locks that lock came with me. <laughs> it's funny because it's one of those security th like safety things that it never happens till it happens. And for anyone yeah. listening, like I highly suggest, like even if you just don't go on your YouTube page, but I find your YouTube page amazing because it's just this smorgasbord of interesting things. Like I don't even know how to describe it. It's just I call it life hacking, but you mm -hmm. literally hack every part of life. Um, I find it interesting when I bought my first gun. I went onto your page because I'm like, I had to buy a gun safe and I made sure to not buy one of the ones that you could break in with like a Lego beast. Because it's just amazing. I think like yeah. the last one you did was the shotgun one. When you had the shotgun, you just like, it basically looked like you could rip it apart with your bare hands, but you just basically like, I think you used a credit card and just like mm -hmm. disassembled it. I'm like, yeah, I'm not buying that when I buy a rifle. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I would say like for anyone out there that doesn't understand like how how much, if people think like, oh, I don't have faith in people, that's why I have security. Like I suggest watch your uh, videos, especially like your 50 minute or 40 minute ones. Cause how fast you're able to break into security that like, I used to walk by these systems thinking like, there's no way anyone could break into it. I'm like, we have to have a lot more faith into like people around us because they're not doing this. Cause like when you literally did, I think it's one of your most famous videos, the, the scotch breaking into the bank. <laughs> yeah, the glass of whiskey to break into a bank spraying it through the door just by blowing it at the sensor yeah yeah and you just like walk by and like didn't do anything i was like i had to ask those have, have you ever because you've done a lot of crazy things has there ever been a time that you've done a job and sorry this is me fanboying a little bit but have you ever done a job where like the police have shown up or you've had guns drawn on you or like please knock on the door because you pull something like that with a glass of whiskey right no we get that we get that question uh, quite a lot fortunately no um, we have first, just in general, almost all of our jobs are friction free success. Even when, like, the initial series of entries, very, very, I'd say 98% have been friction free, full success condition. Some clients will say, All right, wrap it up. We got what we needed. We have proof of concept. We demonstrated impact. Go home. Or I like the clients where we say, Well, let's get a reaction. Let's, let's go bigger. Let's push it more and see what it takes to get a response out of your staff, out of your security professional on site. And we keep going bigger and bigger and more overt 
which is sometimes even scarier, the kind of stuff that still doesn't get you noticed. Uh, in terms of destroy, we've destroyed, we've done destructive attacks. We've drilled doors apart and things. People are like, oh, those, those guys must be working on that door. Um, but as of recently, we have started to do something we never did before, which has been informing in certain contexts, informing uh, law enforcement. A lot of this is driven by, if anyone's not familiar with an incident that happened with a firm called Coal Fire, uh, coal fire again, small world. We everyone knows us. We know them. We've trained coal fire guys, right? They famously were doing a job for the government in Iowa, and the local sheriff's office took umbrage with this. They were caught on the job by a sheriff's deputy, who was ready to let them go because they have all their authorization, they have their credentials. But the actual sheriff himself showed up on the street. He he came to the call, and he felt that it was his little hill and why are these out of towners here? And, but they actually were taken to proper arrest, not, not just what is an arrest. Like this was orange jumpsuit, get your photo, spend 24 hours uh, in the clink. And because of that, the industry has responded with a lot more awareness. And I've done some talks about this, but we have started informing in certain sensitive jobs, uh, some either local or regional law enforcement. Many times local Leos are too friendly with, um, local and small towns, like they might go bowling with the customer. But yeah, we'll speak to county sheriffs or we'll speak to some feds in the area if it's a government job so that somebody is read in on the project. And as long as, you know, even if you were to have a little squeeze of a situation on the on the face to face on the street, you can call you can say, look, go ahead and talk to sheriff so and so somebody who's got enough wasta who shows up to the situation and is like, no, they cleared it with me go away. It just makes people feel, it's a very in-group signaling thing that happens. If a local cop says, oh, well, you spoke to that guy. Well, okay. I guess you, you, you told someone in my field that this was happening. Again, it's reducing your friction. Is the likelihood that, that one of those, maybe a sheriff actually is very friendly with an institution. Maybe that causes a spoliation of the test. If they tell them in advance, like, hey, these guys are coming in. They're going to try to break in, do a good job, Hank, catch them. Fortunately, that's never happened to us. Fortunately, it's only ever been a, just a quick message in a letter. Okay, thank you for informing me. And we tell them, don't, don't communicate this at roll call. Only talk to your, to your, you know, your chief deputy. Uh, and they've honored that for the most part. But uh, fortunately, no, I've never, I've never wound up uh, in the braces uh, on the roadside and hopefully never will. Because you know, the reason I would I would yeah, I wasn't originally going to ask that question, but I instantly popped up my YouTube where I try to like stay it. I'm with you. Like I'm always trying to figure out the news from like different parts with human rights. And like you had the YouTubers that got killed like yesterday, I think it was because oh. they tried to pull a little prank. Oh, the knife. They, oh my God. Yeah. It was a stupid Freaking prank. Don't rights. get me wrong. But like, I'm thinking about that. And it's like, yeah, these guys are idiots. When I'm like, I'm going to talk to someone like you literally are committing a crime by breaking mm -hmm. an entry. So I'm like, that's the reason I wanted to ask you that question when it comes to it. And it's also strange for me, cause like, as I said, I used to be a guard, but I used to be a guard on the more extreme side. Like it wasn't, mm -hmm. it's strange when I'm listening to it. Cause like how the good guards are like happy to see you and like become your best friend in some of the cases. And I noticed like, sometimes I give away information by trying to be a polite, cause I was mm -hmm. a receptionist and a security guard. So you have to be polite. And yeah. you're trying to be helpful, but at the same time, you're not supposed to be doing security. I'm like, some of the stuff that you use to get like gain intel was just stuff that like, that's a normal casual conversation that security guards probably have a thousand times in a week. Oh yeah. Like, oh, I'll be back in, especially when I'm talking to like uh, contractors and stuff, like if they're licensed and clear to be there, like, and they are a clear contractor, because you can't, like I said, you have to be very vetted to yeah. be in the place that I was in. But like, yeah, it's like, hey, I'll be back in X amount of time because my next tour comes around this side or, hey, if you need mm -hmm. me, I'll be over here for the next like 20. And like, yeah, it's a little different there, but like, I'm sure other security guards will do the same thing. And like, maybe I say like, hey, if you need me, I'll be over here. I just told you everywhere I'm not going to be at the same time. <laughs> exactly. And I, th and I think it's something that I find strange because we do hours and hours and hours of security training. But we never go over the stuff that you guys are doing. And I'm like, I think this is where you talked about purple teaming a little bit. Because, like, I was technically blue side team and you're not red team. Maybe people don't understand, like, red team's, like, the attacker, blue team's the defense. But it's like, we're not learning. We're not getting that purple team training that you talk about. And I'm like, with security guards, like, I should be looking out for these things. Because, like, one of our things is check around the building. But if I'm going through these doors every single day, maybe you should ask me to make sure that I'm checking to see that the plates are not moving or that mm -hmm. the laser is in the right spot. And 
for anyone that's like business owners, like take this into side, like, because as you said, you want to get defeated. Like you want to come back and get defeated. Like you're there to help oh, yeah. them. You're, you don't want to break in just as easily. Cause that probably is boring to you. If you keep breaking in the same way, a thousand times over to the same building. Exactly. But I think we're good for this. Um, unless you had any other final thoughts, it was, thank you so much for being on here. This was great. Thank you for reaching out by all means. It's, you never know where, where life's going to take you or what my schedule will be from day to day. And I was just really thrilled when, uh, when you contacted me, I was thrilled about the kind of work you do. And I was really thrilled that I had the time. So this was all, all the positives are on my side of the equation in my opinion. Oh, no, and th this is just amazing for me because I have a conversation with a person that like, I've always been a fan of and like just amazing because you terrify me about how like when I watch your videos about how easy it is to do stuff but also it's I think you're doing a great service because one you're doing this for companies for security but you show don't buy this product because of this like those guys that create those products probably don't like you very much so I'm sure you probably got some bad emails about that we have companies reach out to us to you know as well a lot of times before they bring something to market they they will say hey you know we don't want to wind up looking foolish and throwing good money after bad uh, what do you think of this before we launch it so we do a lot of jobs like that too it's amazing because no, that makes sense because you don't want to be and this goes back to the perspective things we're problem solving where we're talking a little bit with societal issues it's, it all comes from perspective like we can talk about the sex trafficking or we can talk about guns just because you think you know everything which the second someone thinks they're an expert and they know everything that means you know nothing because technology and everything keeps advancing. But just because you think you have this perfect circle and you're from your perspective, you're looking at it, someone else just walking in from a different angle or from a different background can see massive flaws or just basically pull one string and everything falls apart, which you didn't know that there was even a string there, which I think is amazing. And it's a mm -hmm. physical representation of a lot of the social issues that I think the world has. Right on. Um, but Thank so you. this is, uh, so this will be the end of the podcast. Um, so if you enjoy Deviant as much as I do, you can check him out on YouTube and find him all over the interwebs. Um, if you enjoy the Rights and Arms podcast, you can find us on Spotify, Pandora, like wherever you find podcasts. If you want to support us, we do have a Patreon at Rights and Wrongs Pod. And if you want to be on the podcast, you can contact me at rightsandwrongspodcast at gmail.com. If you don't feel comfortable speaking in front of a camera or anything like that, we do do articles which are written by people like you. And we do this because I speak all the time. You don't need my voice. So that's a whole entire community-based project where you can put yourself out there. So email me or my editors about that. And if you want to also support, but you can't give like five bucks a month or a buck a month, we do have cups and hats and t-shirts. So try and support us that way. Uh, thank you so much for being on the podcast again, Deviant. And thank you. Thank you. I'm a fan of it. I, I encourage anyone to keep listening, not just to this episode for me, but all the episodes you put out for you. Oh, thank you. Oh, no, thank you. I could talk to you for like another couple hours, but like that would be, a, yeah. I think I might have to break this out. But yeah, if you ever have another um, issue that you want to come on and talk about, I can go talk to the girl that I'm going to do the sex trafficking one, because I think you guys are coming from two different angles, but you're both very Probably. open people about it. And I'm like, I think like, if that's an open, uh, like if I do a round table and just like, hey, I'll moderate, but like you two go at it because you probably know more about that subject than I do. I could talk to her about it. I would find that. Well, I'm far from, uh, far from knowing much. Depend when do you, uh, when are you scheduled to speak with her? How far into the future? Um, maybe in a couple of weeks or so. Like I have to do, I'm still writing the questions up now because I did the, I gave you an exception to not do a pre-interview. I usually do pre-interviews because mm -hmm. the last time I didn't do it, I didn't want to talk on the podcast. I had a person on that was very well versed in force organ harvesting in China, which is a huge issue. Mm -hmm. but then he was on and talking i'm like okay this is really cool and then he went down this huge q anon like propaganda thing and i'm oh, like jesus like a huge, like really big and like my editor my audio editor is from india and he's like watching this like yeah because he's like oh this is a really good episode we're gonna get this out this is an issue and then he's like we can't publish this and it was the first time i had to contact my photographers my editors and all that I'm like here's the thing i don't think you're gonna have this issue like it was the first time i had to do like can we publish this? Because it's supposed to be educational, but I don't yeah. want to be propaganda. Yeah. Like, there's a difference between controversial conversation and just outward well, lies like you were talking about. Here is here is my only, you know, uh, this has been so wonderful. This is this is great. If you enjoyed it, I, this is the one thing you can do for me and only because I know we're all busy. Um, I am certainly not the expert, but if I send you one link 
to the one of the actual a journalist who lives in town here uh, with me, a journalist named Michael Hobbs and his co-host. Uh, she's in Portland, where my wife is from. They did probably the most well-researched, brilliant podcast ever uh, episode about human trafficking. And it would be potentially a source of incredible notes for you. Potentially, if you feel like priming and prepping uh, for, for that, just because it's it's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, the idea that there are incredible victim stories, there are real victimization happening that isn't getting addressed because of the way we misroute our, our money and our resources. Um, I'll definitely I'd love check. to send you the link if you're up for listening to it. It can inform some of the ways that we do or don't talk about that topic uh, well. No, I definitely would love to do it. Um, it's interesting because like the thing I, how I do it with yours, I didn't really like to prep too much just because like from listening to your stuff, I know you're a conservative, mm -hmm. I'm a talker, but like I've worked in security and military. So like mm -hmm. I know enough of this field to be on the misunderstanding of it as the blue side, which I think is an, also an important thing to be like, we don't know this. Cause I sent your videos to my buddies and they're like, nothing is secure. <laughs> like they're all, all freaking out uh, that I used to work with. Uh, but no, like I'll definitely need that. Cause like, this is the one episode where I'm like, I'm trying to write the questions out. I'm trying to figure out, but I am of such of that lacking of the knowledge where mm -hmm. I don't want, like the main thing about this podcast is I'm sure you've seen a thousand human rights podcasts out there, but my problem is they're either down here where they don't define their terms or they're just using human rights as the shield to fight everything that they disagree with. Yeah. Or they're high end academics that like, if you don't have a master's in it, you don't even understand the first sentence they said. And I'm trying to be that mm -hmm. not baby talk you, but not bore you to sleep or like you need a, to read five research papers before you even oh, get it's, in. No, your, your delivery is perfect. It's really accessible. It it's doesn't, it's not soft delivery. It's just, it's again, it's accessible. And I really, until you said it, I didn't realize what you were doing so well about making it not drowned in academic speech, which can be very, uh, very off-putting. It can be very othering to a lot of people because it's, it is simultaneously makes people feel dumb, but also feel better than because like, who's this highfalutin nonsense person? You know, it's, oh yeah, it's your, your formula is, is laser focused where it should be. I think that's the scary thing too. Is like, I like to try to say, like, I don't want to be politically correct. I want to be academically correct because I don't want to do gatekeeping, but I do feel like when people talk about politically correctness, it's like, I feel political correctness is way too emotionally attached mm -hmm. where it's like, there's certain terms. Like when I talk to people, like is black American, right. Or African, because that's one of the things like, I think black Americans a better term, but African Americans mm -hmm. literally the academic term. So right. like they're strange. But when you're talking about, and this is the reason I brought up the definition, like when I, I was getting so confused with like gun people, where they know all the academic literature for every little groove or different tashing on like oh, yeah. the feeling of a gun. But then when it comes to like talking about policy and stuff like that, they have no idea what they're talking about. Like they're right. scared that Joe Biden's going to come for their guns. I'm like, no, no, is he going to create some like different gun laws that are a little confusing? Yeah, but right. it's because you have people that don't know what they're talking about in politics. But here's the problem is like, you're the one that put the politicians there. So mm -hmm. like, like, that's the thing is like, if you want, or you're not having conversations with, which I try to tell people is like, if you're mad that the other states are getting bad senators, do you have any friends in those states? And if you do, have you talked about the issues that you have a problem with their senators? And have you had a, as you like to say, like an approachable conversation yeah. about it? Because I'm not sure if you listen to the gun podcast that i did with the florida guy um the podcast with let me see which episode that was i that listened was, to like two or three that's 14 part one and part two because i thought it was I, interesting. I actually didn't get to that one yet just because it was a two-parter and i was trying to just get little bite like smaller yeah. bites of your work i have um, it in my list it's like downloaded well i like that one because it was interesting that i didn't realize he was a three percenter because of the flag, I didn't know what that flag was. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. he has an American flag. But like, it was interesting because people are like, I was talking to other podcasts, they're like, oh, second I see a three percenter flag, like, I won't talk to them. I'm like, I had a very enjoyable conversation from someone in Florida where we're both moderates when it comes to gun. I'm just more left leaning, being from Massachusetts, but I'm an extremist because I have a gun license and own a gun. And he's from Florida and has like his. And it was, I was like, this is where I think people need to have these conversations. Like, yeah, we had disagreements. But I think we need that more in society. And like, it's interesting because you clearly like guns and I clearly like guns. And I just find it interesting as a sociological 
aspect. My European friends have are so confused by it because they just ban them, but they get along fine without them. They just prefer to stab each other and glass each other. Like the... <laughs> oh. Right on, man. No, but thank you so much. And thank you for that. Like, I think I took up about two hours of your time. Hey, this was fine. I don't know if you're going to have to break this one up or you get to put it all, you know, in one. Um, and you said, if you want me to, to cross broadcast it, I'm very happy to absolutely to share it uh, through any of my avenues that can help drive, uh, drive to you.